For a long time, I've been wanting to do a podcast on something that's not on a lot of people's minds when they think of Bible translation. Translation for the deaf. Now, of course, this is somewhat awkward to do on a podcast, which is a strictly auditory medium, but I think it's time to do my best to make it happen. Just as some communities are served best by an oral translation, others are served better by a visual translation. And this is the perfect time to talk about this because as of the fall of 2020, we're celebrating the completion of the first full Bible produced in sign language, the American Sign Language Bible. This is Working for the Word, and I'm Andrew Case. Let's get started. I want to start with an introduction to this whole world of translation into sign language. And to do that, I want to share a lot of information that I've gotten from the Deaf Bible Society. So you can go check out their website, deafbiblesociety.org. Now, throughout history, deaf people have been shunned or cast out of hearing communities. And during the time of the Greek philosophers, Aristotle and Socrates, deaf people were thought to have no intelligence. Even during Hitler's reign, deaf people were tested and tormented in science experiments. In the United States, during the 1800s, you may not know this, certain groups tried to pass laws to prevent deaf people from marrying and having children. Even within the last century, deaf people have been forced into orality and the use of signed systems that represent spoken languages instead of being allowed the freedom to use their native sign language. In 1960, William Stokoe, an English professor at Gallaudet University, began researching and writing about signed languages. For the first time, signed languages became recognized as full-fledged living languages independent of spoken languages. That just absolutely blows my mind. This was not until 1960. Absolutely staggering and tragic to me. Now, as we know, translating the Bible is nothing new for the church. It's been around for centuries, yet not one of the world's 400 plus known sign languages has had a full Bible translation up until 2020. And that was the first one. So there's a lot of work to be done. The historical mistreatment of the deaf and the recent recognition of sign languages as unique and distinct languages and the stark reality that only one full Bible translation exists in a sign language. These reasons and more all contribute to the deaf being one of the last and most unreached and unengaged people groups with the gospel. Sign languages are not derivatives. So we want to make this clear. Nor are they simplified versions of a spoken language. They contain structures and processes different from what spoken languages use. A prime example of this is American Sign Language. It's not English. It is its own distinct language. And this is an important thing that I think not a lot of people or not enough people in the church understand. One of the things people might wonder is, why isn't there just a universal sign language? And this idea that there is a universal sign language is one of the biggest misconceptions about the deaf. Just as hearing people have many languages, the deaf also have many sign languages too. Like spoken languages, signed languages are naturally occurring in communities all over the world. Spoken languages use specific sets of sounds to build words, and those words are organized in particular ways with unique meanings to create sentences and paragraphs. Signed languages, on the other hand, have rules for specific combinations of hand shapes, movements, locations near or on the body, and facial expressions to create signs. Each sign language organizes its signs in specific ways, with specific meanings to create sentences and paragraphs, just as spoken languages vary between themselves in how they build words and organize sentences, signed languages vary as well, just as English is completely different from Chinese. Sign languages also have language families. The spoken languages of French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian 
as we know, are all derived from Latin, and the same concept can be applied to some groups of signed languages. Sign languages within the same language family have similar roots, but are all still very different. Another question that might come up in discussions when we're learning about these things is, you know, why can't we just teach deaf people to all read English or some other language and then they can read the Bible? Well, let's talk about what it takes first to learn how to read in a hearing community. First, you usually begin at a young age. For most hearing children, this means starting with the alphabet and attaching sounds to each letter. And they're learning the alphabet because they already know these sounds. They've heard them, they have some vocabulary. And then from there, they begin piecing together the letters to create words, and then the words to form sentences. But for deaf children, learning to read is a different process. They can't hear the sounds in a word. So they have to memorize the sequence of letters as a full word, attach the sequence to a concept, then the concept to a picture. For example, W-I-N-D spells wind, but also could spell wind. So when we hear this spoken as wind, we know whether it's the movement of air or wind, that it's being done to a toy or something. Sound gives meaning to us as hearing people when we read, but for a deaf person, it's still the same scene sequence. Context and contrast are what help give meaning. And this is often why reading a sound or text-based language is not really natural for a deaf person to do. It isn't impossible, but it's not natural. And if you think about it, if we were to reverse roles here, and we imagine we all live in a world where we as hearing people do not have access to the Bible in our mother tongue, English, but instead we are required to learn a sign language in order to hear God's word, a sign language as a second language. Would that be fair? Would that be enough? So that brings us to the next question, and what exactly is a sign language Bible like? How is it translated? So basically, this is done by following established translation principles, things we've talked about on this podcast before, and recording the sign language Bible translation in video format. So a sign language Bible is a video Bible a deaf person can watch and see God's word in their sign language. Now, sign language Bibles typically follow two versions. Chronological Bible translation, CBT, structures the Bible content by stories, such as the creation story. And then you have a book-by-book sign language Bible, which is structured by the traditional chapter and verse breaks. So, CBT and book-by-book are not word-for-word translations, even though that's not even a helpful category, as we talked about with Dave Brunn. If you haven't listened to those interviews with Dave Brunn, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to those. But sign languages are so different from the structure of spoken languages that you're not going to get some kind of equivalent of the NASB or something like that. The sign language Bible translation process follows a similar methodology as a written language translation. Like we just said, only The rewrites and drafts are reshoots, you know, because it's video as the medium. So making big or small changes is actually going to be way more labor intensive than it would be with a traditional text-based translation, which you could do find and replace and in one keystroke, you know, change a hundred key terms. Now, one of the main platforms for publishing Bibles for the Deaf is the Deaf Bible platform. So deafbible.com. It's a place to house sign language Bible content all in one location. And it currently holds scripture in 28 sign languages, a study Bible tool that offers brief introductions and lessons on passages of scripture and the Jesus film with interpretation in a number of sign languages. Users can also access this content through the Deaf Bible app. And there's also a way to distribute the content through storage devices for people living in areas without internet access. Now, since I do not work in sign language translation, I want to have us listen to some people who actually do. The first guest will be Bob Van Zyl, 
But before we listen to him, I want to talk a little bit more about the whole journey and story of getting the first full Bible into sign language. So this American Sign Language translation has been in the works since 1981. Imagine that. So it's been a long time coming. Dwayne King, a minister in the independent Christian church, realized that English was not the heart language of deaf people in America. And so he started learning to sign after meeting a Christian couple in 1970 who didn't come to church much because they couldn't understand what was going on. He and his wife Peggy were moved to meet this need and started a church and a mission for the deaf near one of the nation's leading deaf schools in Council Bluffs, Iowa. After some years of church meetings and small groups and Bible classes, the Kings became convinced it wasn't enough to just sign the English Bible. The Bible needed to be actually translated into American Sign Language. Let me read a quote to you by Dwayne King in a Christianity Today article on this. He says, Most hearing people don't understand how difficult it is to learn to read what you cannot hear. Deaf people rely so much on their eyesight that they want everything to be tangible. They want to be able to see everything. This sometimes makes it harder to grasp intangibles like salvation through faith. Now, to put all of this in perspective, get this, the Braille Bible for the blind was finished all the way back in 1919, more than a hundred years before the first complete Bible for the deaf. Now, to be fair, Braille is not a distinct language, but actually an alternative alphabet that can be read by touch. But ASL, as we said, is not spoken English turned into hand signs. Rather, it's a full language on its own, with its own distinct vocabulary and grammar. Now, you can imagine back in the times before digital technology, doing this kind of work would have been really difficult, much more expensive. So you're talking about recording onto VHS tapes and then sending those out through the mail. This was how the New Testament was done in American Sign Language back in the day. Now, finally, when the technology caught up, they were able to make the videos available for free online through social media and on a smartphone app. This kind of work, as you can imagine, does not come cheap. So the translation was led by deaf people trained in the biblical languages, then recorded in a small TV studio, and it costs about $195 to translate a single verse, and the last four years of work cost more than $4 million. Just this issue of it having to be visual makes it so much more complicated and expensive. So now that we know a little bit more about sign language, and also all of the things involved in bringing the Bible to life in a sign language, let's listen to our brother, Bob, talk about his work as a consultant with sign language translations. Well, I'm Bob Vanzile. I was born in Michigan. I'm the son of a pastor and the grandson of a pastor. And of course, my family thought I was going to be a pastor, but God called me to work in Bible translation. I started out when I was about 25 years old. I came to Columbia the first time. I started with a a spoken language, an indigenous language, along with my wife, Katie, in the Andes region. We worked with the group doing the New Testament, doing literacy and, and all kinds of other things, linguistic analysis and everything. But the whole process of, of translating the New Testament took about 15 years. So it was published in uh, 1991. Then after that, my wife, um, served as a a literacy consultant and then scripture engagement um, related to the use and of of the scriptures, teaching people how to do Bible studies and make materials and everything. And then when I was about, I think, 54, something like that, I, I don't quite remember, there was starting in Columbia a project for the deaf of Columbia, which actually is one of the larger unreached groups in Colombia. It happened that they needed a translation consultant. I was working in administration and doing some consulting, but not a lot. 
at the time. So I thought, well, this will be interesting to uh, because it was going to be a translation in video, not in a print form. I had never worked with the deaf. I will say that God put deaf into my life long before that. When I was living in the south of Columbia, there was a church that had a deaf ministry with uh, 40 to 50 deaf that came on Sunday afternoons. And I'd greet them and I would go to their programs. They would have like Christmas programs and do signing and, and do praise, signing and dramas and everything. But I didn't really even understand what a sign language was. In my uh, graduate studies in linguistics, I didn't have a day in which they talked about sign language. And so I think God kind of put my focus on the indigenous language, which is called Kamsa or Kamansha, that, that I worked on in the Andes. And so even though in my vision was the deaf work, God wanted me to complete certain uh, steps in, in his plan for my life before I would be involved with the deaf. So I had this opportunity and we, uh, we were checking the first three chapters of Genesis. It was so different. I, I, I don't know how to describe it, seeing everything visually, and not really understanding what's going on, because in some sense, because everything is visual and gesture, and with the signs with your hands, your grammar is all over the place. It's not like in a written, a spoken language where you can say, oh, well, this is a verb, this is a noun, and all that, and you see it in a linear perspective. Here, there was a piece here in, in, in the facial expression. There was a movement over there. And it was just, I didn't know what to do with it. And I asked God about it. And, and, and it was really a struggle. And he just <laughs> comforted me and told me that this was a language. That was a, and it was a people group he loved and that he'd get me through it. And the interpreters were wonderful. The deaf were very patient and everything. And and I checked the three chapters and thought, okay, that's it. But it wasn't. There were some big changes in my life in which we had to make a decision if we were staying in Colombia or going to another place. And my wife, Katie, and I decided that God was calling us to Colombia to stay in Colombia. We were also very involved in training missionaries. And so that was one of the foci that we had and um, certain groups that God showed us. One of those groups was the Colombian sign language. He was showing me that that I that he wanted me to work as a translation consultant for them. I thought, okay, well, I have Spanish. I have learned various languages. But then God said to me, he said, okay, I want you here in Colombia. There are things I want you to do. And one of them is to work with the deaf of Colombia. And in my previous experiences as a translation consultant, I was able to, in a written text in that language, I could identify certain key terms and sometimes even some of the grammatical structures. But I realized that in order to be a good sign language translation consultant, I needed to learn the language. And I rebelled against that because I said, oh, God, I've learned so many languages. I, I don't want to go through that fog again. But, but God showed me uh, that that was what he wanted me to do. And so I did. I went through it again. I often thought, why? Well, I'm not a young man. I'm 55. At that point, I was. These fingers, these hands don't move like a young person's would. They don't finger spell like... Um, the young people that I saw that were hearing people that were communicating with the deaf. But I, I knew that God wanted me to do it, and, and I accepted it. And I, I think it was one of the most important things I could do in order to be a good sign language consultant. Because unlike the spoken languages, if you are able to communicate in a sign language, you can help as a consultant you can be involved and give suggestions that I can't give unless I know the language quite well. So that was, that was a new experience for me, humbling at times, but something that has opened a whole new world to me 
um, in working with the deaf and realizing so clearly that they haven't had access to the word. They've had interpreters, but they haven't had access to the word. Currently, I've worked with a number of uh, sign language translation projects in the Americas in a number of countries, but uh, currently I'm working with four. I'm working uh, with Colombian sign language and uh, Brazilian sign language, which is called Libras, Honduran sign language, which is called Lejo, and uh, Salvadorian sign language, which is Lesa. So I, I work um, with one or two teams in each of these countries. With uh, Honduras, I'm working on Luke and Genesis. With Colombia, on Mark and 1 Corinthians. Then with uh, Brazil, I'm working on a series of uh, stories in a, that are full translations of verses. There's, uh, they're not story in the sense that they have not included all of the content or all of the verses. And so I'm working with them in a, in a series. Um, right now, we're working in some stories from the life of Abraham and of Moses. And, and with uh, El Salvador, I'm working in the book of John. When somebody is thinking about Bible translation, what would you tell them? You know, most people thinking about Bible translation are thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a text-driven person, but this is usually overlooked. So maybe give the persuasion that you would give somebody to consider moving in this direction. I think first, they would have to understand the need of the deaf. So many times that's not understood clearly. It was very interesting to me that when I was involved in a discipleship course for the deaf in my church in Bogota, that I was working with a, an interpreter. I, I was signing and everything and, and teaching, and, but this was a person more skilled who was um, an interpreter for the church. I've never considered myself an interpreter. I've done it, but I don't consider myself that. And we had a group of deaf. At that point, there wasn't very much in their sign language, their Colombian sign language. And so we gave them an uh, an easier text version of the Bible in Spanish. And I would see them take each word and try to sign it. And then they would get done and you'd say, well, what did you understand? And they understood nothing. <laughs> and, and part of the reason is, is that the grammatical structure of sign languages is so different than some of our national languages. And so they were trying to understand it, but in a Spanish grammatical structure. And so it was very obvious to me that they needed something more. And I remember one of the students, it was very, very disappointing, but um, even though, as I said, I, I, I team taught with somebody who had years of experience, but at the end of the time in this di discipleship semester of, of training, um, when we were debriefing, one of them said, I didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was kind of uh, deflating. But I realized the tremendous need of the deaf that they don't have access to Spanish. They haven't heard the national language. They can learn to read it to a certain extent, some more than others. They, they really need something in the language that, they, they, that is their heart language. And so I also saw that when we worked with the deaf in my church and used some of the first translations done by the Colombian Sign Language team, which was a series series of, of Bible stories that uh, were used in a whole process of evangelism. And so I remember when uh, we were doing the, uh, the stories, the first three chapters of Genesis, and we would do one video, which was just one chapter, and it would it, we would watch it like three or four t weeks in a row. It took that much time because the deaf had so many questions, and some some and, and needed to see things ag again in order to be sure they understood them. And and so as I look at that, I look at my life, and I say, okay, I'm. I have a background, I have a degree, um, an undergraduate degree in anthropology. And so I've always been interested in cultures, but this was a very different culture. 
So what I might say to a person is, is that what I've said about the need. I'd also say you need to be a person that is very expressive. I think people, um, a person that wants to communicate. One of the wonderful things that I have learned and I have appreciated in working with the deaf is the whole area of praising God, um, both in the context of a deaf ministry where an interpreter um, leads the deaf and all those that can sign in praising God in that sign language. Sometimes when I'm really feeling pressure in my life, or I remember uh, when God took my wife a f- couple of years ago, I was so much in my grieving process that the only way that I could first praise God was in Colombian sign language. I couldn't do it with words. And there's just this incredible expression of, of being able to praise God in a way that you've never done it before even more than uh, when they are copying and participating with hearing people with music and everything. One of the most beautiful things is to see the deaf create their own songs, many times based on scripture and many times based on their life experience. And all of us doing it together, like in El Salvador, 50 deaf and, and a few hearing people that are part of the ministry, just all of us going through that part of feeling lost, that part of feeling alone that the deaf feel so much, and then seeing Jesus come into their life and how it changes. And they tell that whole story. It's an amazing thing. If you have that kind of a desire to to express in those kinds of gesture and body and hand ways, then maybe God has created you to work with the deaf. So the next thing I wanted to know is, what are some of the challenges in consulting on a sign language project? I say it takes three times as much, it's three times as much work to work on a sign language translation as a consultant than a spoken language. Yesterday, I was working uh, with Guambiano, which is an indigenous language in Colombia, and we're working on 2 Samuel. There are problems with the translation. The, these I've worked with these people for many, many years. I was the tr- consultant for their New Testament, and now we're working on books in the Old Testament. They have their computers. We work by Zoom at this point. Hopefully, we'll be together again in the Andes at some point. When we discuss something, when they understand the concepts or the problem in the translation, they work on it. Their cultural norm in solving a problem is that they all talk at once and the volume gets louder and louder and then it starts to decrease. And finally, there's silence. And then I know that they've made a decision. So then they they tell me what it is. They explain it to me. And if I agree, then the translation is changed to this new this new version it's put in their computers, and that's my participation with that translation because I've approved it. With sign languages, I usually am involved in a much more interactive way. Well, at the beginning, while the team is investigating, now you have to remember that these people, they have different levels of understanding the Spanish text, even as I shared about my experience with um, the discipleship process in my church. And so one of the things that I have been doing is at the same time that they're doing their investigation, I as a consultant do my own investigative notes with commentaries and study and think about how would I express this in the sign language I'm working in and try to give them some ideas. And I give them my Spanish notes, but I also do PowerPoints. They're all very visual. And I try to explain uh, the concepts and relationships in a visual manner. And it really, really helps the deaf. That That's something that's I think is unique about it. Um, Another thing is that part of deaf identity is their artwork. In almost every deaf culture community I have been privileged to to work with or or to enter in one way or another, there are incredible deaf artists. And so one of the features 
of sign language translation is that usually there are a lot of illustrations to go with the videos. A lot of use of maps um, and charts and for genealogies to picture the genealogy and those kinds of things. And so part of my job is to evaluate these illustrations to make sure that they are faithful to the text itself and that they don't conflict with the text. For instance, I I was checking an illustration, Mary and uh, Joseph and Jesus with Simeon in the temple, but the background of the of the building that was behind them didn't look at all like the temple. It, it had some kind of columns, but it didn't look like any of the kind of models or, or our concept of what Herod's temple, this, the second temple looked like. And so it was really important to change some of those things, but it's been very exciting to, to see their imagination, their creativity, both uh, the, translation team and the artists working with them to do illustrations of things that I've never seen in any other context. For instance, in Ephesians 2, where it talks about the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, and the dividing wall, and that Jesus is their peace. And so the Colombian deaf made a presentation in which you start out with two groups. One is obviously Jews by their dress and, and just their their appearance. And the others are obviously more of a Greek, Roman kind of uh, culture being represented. And in the middle, there's a wall, a brick wall between the two of them. And so as the moving presentation, video presentation proceeds, in the background, Jesus appears with his arms stretched out to embrace both groups. And as Jesus embraces both groups, the wall, brick by brick, starts falling down and it disappears. The two groups come together with Jesus embracing them. And that's something that is a gift from the deaf to Mm. all of us to understand something like, like a passage like that. What is the dividing wall? And how is it removed? And to see it like that was was amazing. Go to the website called Deaf Bible, choose the Colombian flag, then choose Ephesians, and then choose the chapter. In the case of Ephesians, it'd be chapter two. And you can see it. <laughs> you can see Wow. It okay. So it's already online. That's awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it is online. Bob also shared about the unique challenges of choosing how to translate key terms and names. For instance, Capernaum, they looked at pictures of the ruins. They looked at, uh, they studied what was Capernaum famous for. They did quite an investigation. And then they finally, they saw that one of the important products in the time of Jesus was olive oil. And so they used one hand, and then the other in a fist, they roll it in the other hand like you were using a grinding stone to grind the olives. And that's the sign for Capernaum. Or Beersheba. Uh, Beersheba, of course, has a well. And so you cup your hands like a C and put a B to it in one of the sign languages, and there's your your sign for Beersheba. It's an amazing process. Or David, you start with your hand, one hand and a fist. The other one is like you're playing a harp, and you take that hand and put it up to your head as if you're putting a crown on your head. And that's the sign for David in, in Colombian sign language. Whereas in another sign language, they take a D, in, in, in their sign language, how you form the letter D, and they swirl it just like it was a slingshot. Yeah, so that gives you some idea. And so one of the things that I do a lot of times, like in Honduras, they have a national committee of Christian deaf from like about 15 cities and towns in Honduras that meet together two or three times a year to choose their biblical signs. And they started out with all the books for the, of the Bible. And then they went to Bible characters. And then they publish 
all these signs. It's very interesting though, because um, sometimes for some of the signs, they have a tradition and different parts of the country have a different sign they've been using in their churches and in their ministries. And so they present their signs and then the whole group votes and that's the sign for the whole country. I've been at some of those meetings and it's, it's really quite beautiful, the whole process. But um, what they've asked me to do as a consultant is to give them the bi biblical background. Why is Beersheba import, important in the Bible? Or I was working with the Argentine uh, sign language and they wanted to know, know the root of the Exodus. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, there's at least three. <laughs> and you, and you yeah. have different uh, ideas of where Mount Sinai is and everything. And, and they said, but the dev said, but we want to know the right one. And I said, well, I don't know that I can tell you the right one. You can <laughs> choose one, but you better give some explanation about the others, you know. So another thing that um, I have found that I needed to do, I remember in working with the Brazilian sign language team that we were working on Noah, the whole thing of the days of the year, and 40 days, and 150 days, and two weeks, and one week, and all of this was just very confusing to them and trying to think of it. And I remember one night I thought, we cannot go on with this. The, I asked the Holy Spirit to just show me what to do. And I stayed up most of the night. I was really tired <laughs> and I was really worn out, but with God's power and, and wisdom, I made a chart of the time in the ark of, that Noah was with his family and tried to coordinate it with the rise of the water and then the, then the lowering of the water until he left the ark. It really helped. I, only the Holy Spirit could have helped me do that. But the next day, they understood. They understood the different parts of that whole four chapters of the life of Noah. And that's the beautiful thing of working like this. You see that you come to your, your wit's end, <laughs> to, your, to your knowledge, to your ability, and, and to your strength. And then it becomes God because you can't do it anymore. And he comes in in, in incredible ways to make his word clear. It, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing. I hope you enjoyed listening to Bob share from his heart and experience. For those of you who are new to this podcast, we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. And this podcast exists ultimately to help you treasure the Bible, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1.